And uh, thank you very much to yourself and the other session organisers for inviting us to speak here today. As Julian said, we were one of the AHRC EPSET funded projects and uh, it was called the Immersive Partnerships Call. So it would only be right for me to start by telling you a bit about the partnership that we were working with. Um, you can see the uh, logos behind me. Uh, our partnership consists of myself and my colleagues at uh, Bournemouth University, not least um, Elizabeth Faulkner, who can't be here today, who was really the brainchild behind this project. Um, Dayden, who are a virtual reality um, specialist, <coughs> excuse me, Satsynth, who specialise in soundscapes, and the National Trust, who, for those of you who are not aware of them, they are a very long established organisation uh, that work in uh, Wales, England and Northern Ireland uh, to preserve and protect places of historic and natural interest. And they have over five million members uh, and they are the people who manage the site I'm talking about today. So what am I going to talk to you about? I'm going to talk to you about a project called Virtual A3. Now, Virtual Avery is a simulation, and I, I thank Will for talking about that and bringing up that discussion. It's, it's very clearly a simulation, not a reconstruction, of how Avery, Henge, and Stone Circle might have looked around 2300 BCE. And what I'm going to take you through is how we um, made it, um, importantly, what Avery is and why we actually um, started there. But I'm going to try and spend most of my time today talking about the evaluation we did because that was really a key part of our grant and some of the results we got from that and picking up on some of the questions we had earlier, some of the challenges and some of the surprises we had um, from those data sets. So let's start with, for those of you not familiar with the site, I want to talk to you a little bit about Avery to give you the context of the site we're talking about, why we chose it in the first place. So Avery Henge and Stone Circle, it's a prehistoric monument. It's in Wiltshire um, in central southern uh, UK. It is um, quite a dispersed uh, monument. The diagrams you can see on the screen behind me. Um, if you look, you can see the one that's got the, the labels on it, prehistoric henge. That henge, which is a ditch with an internal, uh, a bank with an internal ditch, is about a kilometre in circumference. This is a very, very large um, monument. Inside that, where you see it's written stone circles, there's a number of stone circles, the largest of which is about 350 metres in diameter, consists of probably over 90 stones, which are uh, anywhere between three and a half, four and a half metres in, in height. And then it's got a number of other stone settings inside it. I'm sure uh, the eagle eye interview will have spotted that currently this monument, and it has had for many uh, hundreds of years, has been dissected by a number of roads. It has an entire village in it uh, and a range of other buildings, and um, it is on one of the main thoroughfares to uh, Swindon, uh, a large uh, town to the north of it. So when you visit it, it's quite disarticulated, or it can, it can feel that way um, for the visitor. So, unlike the other famous monument that it's situated in the same World Heritage Site as, Stonehenge, which some visitors to Avery still believe they're visiting, believe me, I discovered this summer, which <laughs> was quite a shock, that was a surprise. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it can be very hard to get a sense of actually what the monument uh, looked like um, when we're talking about prehistory. So uh, the National Trust was very interested in different ways of presenting this um, to the public. So that led us to develop Virtual Avery. So I'm going to talk to you a bit now about how we actually put it together. Um, we started with the Environment Agency LIDAR data um, and Dayton took that and they used their own Fieldscapes platform um, to create uh, some of the first terrain models and they formed the ditches and banks and um, then they started to interpret the heights based on uh, the archaeological data that we, that we know of um, from uh, the archaeologists in, in the project. And to attempt to start to reconstruct, not to reconstruct it, to simulate it, I'm going to be careful my words, <laughs> as it might have been uh, around 2300 BCE. So we got the basic model, um, and then we all started working in world to uh, develop the visual and the, and the audible character, and that's really important because it's both of these aspects that are part of this project. 
And uh, you can see below that Satsip started to uh, build their soundscape um, structure. And the types of sounds that we had in um, Virtual Avery uh, were a range of, I say human voices, but they're kind of muffled human voices. So you can't hear actual words and things like that, but you can hear laughing and kind of um, calling, etc. but you can't um, disarticulate the words. We also had things like um, sort of sounds of animals, sounds of um, stone tool use, etc. as well. We had um, a few artifacts within our um, environment as well. We had some uh, grooveware, uh, so the pottery of that time, and we also had some uh, red deer antler picks, and they were located at various uh, places around um, the environment. Um, and we also had two uh, avatars um, that were dressed in sort of prehistoric uh, outfits that were in there as well, but they, they were static, uh, but they were in there too. So all the parts were synthesized to form that. In, and actually the partnership found this very, very straight, well, straightforward, but it was a very enjoyable and easy thing to, to do. And actually the really hard part was getting it to work in Avery which uh, for those of you who've been there is well known as the mobile phone black spot of Wiltshire. Uh, and um, uh, at the time we were having to run it off, off field scope, so we needed that mobile phone connection. And we managed to get around this um, by a variety of um, tricks involving uh, bamboo sticks and uh, <laughs> little mobile phone um, connectors. But um, we were not outside, we were in the barn in Avery, which is, is as the name suggests, a barn where the museum is that is associated with the site. So it's actually on site. Visitors may come in there before they go around the monument, after they go around the monument. It's quite variable. Um, but they do need to be a National Trust member if they don't want to pay. So you tend to get more of those uh, members coming in there. Uh, the barn is quite dark, um, doesn't have many facilities, and it has a lot of resident bats. And bats and technology are not always the best of friends after six months, believe me. It's the, uh, not the bats necessarily, it's what the bats leave behind that can be a slight issue. <laughs> but we managed all of that with the help of a lot of the National Trust uh, volunteers. But what really happened with Virtual Avery and what our key part of our grant was, was to take it out into the barn uh, for over 40 days and actually run it and collect user evaluation. And um, we did that last summer, um, over the summer months. It was very, very hot last year in the UK. It was very hot inside that barn. But we got over 700 people um, to try the experience, which was a huge amount. Um, and we actually got evaluation data from 388 of those, which is a very large sample set. Now, our users, although they range from 16 to 85, that's only the ones that we've included in the evaluation sample set. We did have a lot of uh, users under 16, but for various ethical and practical reasons, we're, we're not including them here. They came from all over the world, but predominantly from the UK. Um, and you can see some of the, the, um, hundred, you know, the 108 others who came from the 18 different countries uh, on the map um, below. So what were our users like? Well, I hope you can see this. So I don't know how good the, the screen is at, at the back. This is the age and gender distribution of our users. The, the uh, blues are males, the reds are females. Um, and we got predominantly um, users who were in the 45 uh, and older age groups. And that really is not surprising because it reflects a lot of the membership of the National Trust. So you've got a lot of um, parents and grandparents visiting with their uh, relatives, and that's the sort of the main uh, demographic that you're getting at, at that time. Um, to give you a sense of how it differs to certainly the UK population, um, you can see that here we've got our, our data is in purple, the UK population uh, average is in green. You can see that we've got this big spike at that sort of 44 plus going up into the plus 75. So I think that's something to be aware of when I talk about these evaluation data, um, that that is uh, what it's re reflecting. So we asked a lot of questions, uh, not just age, gender, demographic questions, but we asked a lot of questions about IT use. 
uh, experience with IT, uh, experience with immersive, um, any other form of immersive um, technology. Um, we also asked them about um, how they felt about uh, Avery, whether they'd been there before, etc. It was quite an extensive questionnaire. It was run off um, tablets after they'd done the experience themselves, and um, you know, it probably took them um, five to ten minutes to do. So it was quite a, you know, it was it's quite a lot of data. I'm only presenting some of the the highlights uh, today. So what did they say? Well, generally. Everyone really, really enjoyed using Virtual Avery. And I'm going to show you a couple of graphs now that split down a few of the specific questions. They found it was engaging. Um, they found um, that they th it made them think a lot more about the environment. And some of the emotions they experienced, we wanted to see how comfortable they were when they're immersed in uh, the Oculus Rift headset. Very few found it difficult um, at all, and there's no correlation between that and any previous IT use either. Um, there's that, the whole enjoyment aspect doesn't seem to have any statistical connection with how comfortable you might feel about IT before. We asked them about the soundscape as well, and they really enjoyed that. That was something else. Um, a very small sector. Um, said they didn't notice it, and there are soundscape guys who said that uh, uh, they would like to think that's because it was so good that <laughs> <laughs> it was part of the natural environment. But um, uh, it was it was really interesting, um, and uh, you know the users seem to really uh, enjoy that aspect of it as well. We collected free text data as well, and I've put a few sort of quotes up as we uh, go along that you can sort of read, and that's the barn um, just above me on the left, and you can see someone using it there. We had either one or two users in world at any one time, so there's also some uh, things there about interaction that I can talk more about later. But sense of place is one of the parts of the call that we were looking at, and what was interesting is the majority of our users um, here said we asked them two questions around this and they said they do get that really strong sense of being in in the place and actually being in a landscape we asked the question slightly differently as well and we said how believable do you think it is uh, and you, know, you can see then the majority thinks either fairly or very uh, believable um, uh, to to be there and they seem to like the appreciation of, of being in VR, but then being able to go out into the monument or vice versa, you know, you're, you're not um, very far from it. But what I want to end on, I suppose, is, is I want to explore one of the things that was a bit surprising to us. Um, and what we observed um, when we were doing all of the uh, evaluation was that often we would get groups, family groups coming to us, and what we would get was we would often find, particularly women, probably over the age of about 45, would be reluctant to try the technology. They would rather let the, you know, the uh, male member of the party and the child go first. And we wanted to understand what this was about, whether there was a, a gender relationship uh, with IT. So we started examining the data. And what we found actually surprised us, we were talking about um, things that you don't expect, when we looked at the data, unsurprisingly, in the 16 to 24 age group, they're the highest users of um, using uh, games and IT. If you go above 44, all of a sudden, uh, when we started asking questions about how regularly do you play computer games, and that could include tablet games as well as um, immersive or on-screen games, um, all of a sudden, after about 44, um, it's the, the female um, side of our evaluation data hits a, a peak. And if you go um, to 65 and above, there are more women playing computer games than there are men. And so it's made us really think about what it is we might know, need to do in iterations of Virtual Avery to make our work more accessible um, to uh, those uh, people over 44 um, who are women. And I should say, though, when they tried it, they loved it. So there wasn't, it was just that reticence to sort of step over. But it was really interesting to see um, something that I think many of us had felt um, sort of, you know, stereotype of who actually plays computer games. In our data, there's some very surprising uh, results from that. So 
just to sort of wrap up, really, I suppose what I, you know, what I hope I've shown you is just a sort of snapshot of some of the, the data we've got from Virtual Avery. It was a, a real um, success, but I think that the key take-home message for us from our um, project was that we couldn't find um, any um, significant relationship between or association between uh, age or gender or familiarity with IT with enjoyment and engagement and immersion in this type of um, uh, immersive heritage, you know, experience. And in fact, what all we had was we want to spend longer on it. We want to do more on it. Managing demand was really difficult. But one of the things we're doing in, in the future is we're looking at ways to embed this within the barn so that the volunteers with the National Trust can um, continue running um, virtual Avery into the, the future. So we're looking at sustainable ways to continue this type of um, activity. So thank you very much.